Hey everyone, this is Dojo Talks, our podcast. Today we are going to be doing a tier list of the best chess players never to become world champions. I feel like this is an interesting topic. We've been meaning to do this for a while, ever since our um, infamous rankings of the world's best players. And uh, yeah, today we're going to rank all the greats um, that never quite made it to that world champion level. If you're listening to this on the podcast, um, you may want to check out the YouTube version if you want to see uh, pictures of all the players as well as, you know, the, the final tiers and rankings. Otherwise, you can definitely keep listening. I think it'll be pretty clear. Um, we've picked 18 players ranging from uh, the earliest being uh, Shigorin all the way up to some modern players like Fabi and Nepo. Um, so we'll be ranking all the uh, all the biggest stars um, since then. Um, we chose a limit, I think, um, Morphe and recent, right? So there's no, <laughs> there's no confusion. There were no official world champions before Morphe anyway. Morphe was kind of like the first unofficial world champion, if anything. Um, so it wouldn't make sense to rank players before that time. Uh, so we got four tiers. I'll explain them real quick. We got world champion level, which basically means they could have been world champion you know, if they just had a one lucky break, right? They were very close. We have contender, which you can argue about the definition, but for me, it means, you know, very close, could have competed or did compete for the world championship. Um, then we have elite level players who are elite, but not quite contender status. Um, and then a very rude uh, pretender label <laughs> that we've put up. Um, obviously, all these players are amazing, um, but yeah, some of them are not going to be quite as accomplished um, as the others. Oh, and real quick for the YouTube audience, um, we are going to be ranking the Swedish Ulf Anderson and not the German Adolf Anderson, just so everyone is clear. And let's just say if anybody has to use the pretender label today, that means that somebody else you know, shouldn't have put that name on the list, basically, right? It means like we got something wrong because we're not supposed to be discussing players who are not top players today. Well, it'll be, it'll be interesting to find out. Uh, it'll be interesting yeah. to to see. Um, you guys have anything to say before we get into it? Any final words? I just thought, because I think a sub-theme of this will be like, who are some of the most who's the most talented players of all time. And so I think that's a sub thread going to go through this discussion. So maybe a fun other thing we could do is like the most talented players of all time, but that's a different, so either way, it'll play into it. It'll play into this. Yeah. Oh, and quick shout out to um, Sam Copeland, of chess.com. Um, I use some of his pictures here. He had a tier list, um, just the best chess players ever, which included a bunch of world champions. So I couldn't just use that one. So, we made our own here, but yeah, wanted to give him credit for some of the picks. Um, and uh, yeah, let's get into it. We're going to start chronologically with the uh, earliest players. I think the earliest on our list is Shigorin, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, yeah, let's um, let's put him. I think this was my pick. Uh, I think I chose him. I would mm -hmm. place him... He was very good. He did compete for a world championship against Steinitz. And in fact, he was very close. He would have been world champion um, if he literally didn't blunder a maiden two in the final game against Steinitz. Like it was that close. Really? Uh, I thought he lost by like five games. No, no. He lost in the final game. Wow. After blundering like a winning position. Um so super, super close. Uh, so for me, I would say he was a contender. Honestly, very close to just being world champion outright. But I would put him, I I would maybe could change it up later. But I would put him at contender. He lost by four games their first world championship match and by two games their second world championship match. Two games. Yeah. So that final game. Maybe he blundered me into in a winning position. No, he did. He did. <laughs> yeah, that final game would have been, I guess, would have been tied it up then. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Okay, so what what do you what how does it work? And you put him in contender? Is that what you're Well, doing? I would put him in contender, but then you guys have to you have to give your rankings, right? So oh, I see. this isn't I the final, but we'll average it out. Okay. David, what do you think, buddy? Um, I gave Chigorin a B a B for <laughs> elite. Uh-huh. Um Yeah, it. I mean, I think you could. I think you could make the case for for what Costia said. So I don't have like a very very strong opinion about it. I hesitated for a while on A or B for him, <clears throat> but you know, finally decided that. I mean, I'm I'm not the greatest expert on eighteen eighty nine, but I I, and they didn't even have ratings, which I tend to lean on. So, <laughs> I decided <laughs> he was about number four in the world, not number two, and so. And, you know, I don't know. I didn't I didn't realize there was that much drama in the last game. So just off the scores, I felt like Steinitz was comfortably ahead of him, which I was perhaps wrong about. So. OK, I'll be a controversy. I'll put you in the pretender category. And, and let me just explain the. In the 1880s, uh, the Germans were dominant, the Europeans were dominant, and it was just at the beginning of the Russian chess boom. And then the Russians did a kind of hagiography of Jagorin in hindsight. They were like, this dude established the Russian school and um, you know, they produced him, they put him on a pedestal as being the first one to like light this spark that then you know takes over the country. And so the guy's a fine player, but it was never on the highest level. And, you know, when they're playing old Steinitz, the poor old dude, trying to beat up on some old man in foreign lands, dude, come on. First, he spanked him the net first time. Maybe he had a chance in the second time. Steinitz, that guy was barely playing. He's running around the world. Give him a break. Stop messing with him, man. So anyways, I put him in the pretender. Wow. Okay. okay. Yeah. So, I mean, you have a point. I, at, at a certain point, anyone could have beaten Steinitz, you know. <laughs> well, but but hang on, I mean, you're not saying that the Russians invented the world championship matches, Jesse, and they never happened or anything like that, are you? No, I'm saying the the reason Kosi even put him on this list is because the in the back of his school of chess, which has put this dude on a pedestal for years. That's the only reason he's on the list. So one of the interesting things about basically everyone on this list is there certain non-chess factors that go into judging them, mm -hmm. right? Why is Nimzovich mentioned? Because he wrote some books. That's why. <laughs> so there's a lot of like secondary reasons why people get put on this list. Or if there's some kind of historical, I didn't have a shot at it. There's all kinds of stuff that goes into, you know, the background of this list. Um, okay, but here's here's a I, very so, reasonable. So, so here's what I'm saying. When you look at dude's games, you look at the results, he was not on the level with those of his generation. Not was he, on the was level. he maybe very talented? Yeah. Okay. Let's, yeah. Yeah, I think he scored pretty well. I mean, in terms of his results. Yeah, Jesse, Jesse's just I mean, there's a reason he had deep end on the first on the yeah, first yeah. <laughs> Yeah, two world I mean, championship matches. Yeah, with, with right. Stein. In terms of like how someone got put on this list, okay, there might be non-chess reasons for some people that might mm -hmm. boost our general feeling for them or something. But there are mm -hmm. chess reasons as well, right? And chess reasons would be things like playing in a world championship match. That would mm -hmm. probably be the first thing that made us think of some of these names and put them on the list. Another would be just sort of like what's their head-to-head -head score against the world champions who were world champion during their era right so like if you think of caruana you're probably going to think like how well or badly did he score against magnus right if you think about chigorin how well or badly did he score against steinitz because he played during the steinitz era and the answer is like lifetime he played 50 plus games with steinitz and was minus three like against the best player of his era i mean and, and Kosti didn't put him in because of the russians Kosti put him on the list because he played two world championship matches that was like Okay, look, I'm going to say the, noise on the, list. the best performance dude had, Hastings 1895, and his best performance was second place. Okay, 
So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm not going to say no, that he was as good as the world champions. A, why didn't he get a shot, dude, at Steinitz multiple times? Because the Russians were pumped, dude. Because they were pumped on chess and on this dude. Is it a great yes. story? Yes, okay. I'm just telling it's you true. That. Yeah. It's true. Playing a world championship match in this earlier historical phase would weigh less than winning your way through a candidates match and playing a world championship match for some of the later players we'll discuss. Absolutely. That's a fair point that we should keep in mind. Mm -hmm. But, um, but, but still, I mean, the odds are high that Chigorin was among the top five players in the world at that time. No. I mean, second place is one of these big terms. The best he did, dude. I don't know, man. I don't know. He's playing some chumps in these other tournaments, dude. You know? All right. I mean, I think our, our average is clear. All right. Average is clear. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, well, uh, he's going in the elite section. Um, right? Clear average. Okay, yeah. David said elite. I said contender. Jesse said uh, pretender. I have, um, I'm have. i fine with that. I mean, it's, it's definitely um, offensive to the... The entire Soviet uh, chess history. <laughs> all right, we know whatever. <laughs> so, so, People should not get too offended about things Jesse says. That's yeah, I, I do want to do want to confirm that a few of these players are on here mainly because um, the, they're like they're quite popular. Um, and you know, I looked up other lists like best players, and mm -hmm. if a player showed up on on those lists, then I want to include them there because my least favorite comments on YouTube we're always just like, why wasn't so and so included, right? So I'm just trying to just trying to nip all those comments um in the bud. Yeah, I mean you're already going to be asked like, you know, why Chigorin not Pillsbury or blah. I mean there's there's no way like for every person you add, they're sort of lower down and then someone else comes into the conversation. So I think you just have to give up. <laughs> on trying to <laughs> evade those comments they're coming for you That's, oh yeah oh, I've, you've signed up for it i've given up all right let's move on to who's next um there's schlechter well tarash is first right in, oh tarash yeah that's right. Um, I, my, I mean my list i mean just i don't actually know who was around i mean it's just uh purely um purely guesswork um but just approximating but yeah tarash he was playing i think a little bit before selector anyway um maybe let me take this one first because it just yeah this is your guy. a little bit with um what we we're saying with um with Chigorin. now so tarash has an interesting thing where the germans he was kind of like held up in the same way that um the russians held up Chigorin in the sense that he was like they even call him the Prekeptor Germania, the teacher of G Germany, right? And so he writes this book. I can still recommend this book, uh, 300 Chak Patien, 300 Chess Games, great book. Kasparov talks about it as one of the best books of all time. And so in a similar way, it's like, why does he make the list? It has a lot to do with his placement in a cultural chess tradition. Um. Now, just my sense of the guy going through the games and going through the records, you know, how he did in various tournaments, uh, you know, I'm going to put him somewhere between contender and elite. Um, he has the problem, really, that he's a, you know, he's a, has to fight Lasker and Lasker's just beating him down. <laughs> so I think I'm going to go with elite just because Lasker crushed him so terribly. You know, and then in the tournaments, he's doing fine, but he's not like crushing fools all the time. Uh, so I'm going to I'll leave it there with elite. Yeah, that's what I put for him as well. And I also hesitated between contender and elite and sort of placed him in elite based on me perceiving that there was a rather large gap between him and uh lasker so cool i think i would yeah i'd put him somewhere there as well so i think we're gonna go elite then sounds like we're all kind of on the fence between contender and elite status but closer to elites yeah. um i mean if i have it correct he lost a world championship match to lasker by five games 
Yeah. And Which he is drew, substantial, although that was more common back then than now. But check this out. He drew against Shigorin, but he won more tournaments than Shigorin. Right. So he definitely he definitely yeah. won some great tournaments. Um, yeah, you know. Oh, but okay. In my defense of Shigorin, I feel like Shigorin was around a little bit earlier, and I consider Tarush to be like a more recent player. Mm -hmm. so. Well, that's true. I mean, Chigorin is fighting Steinitz and Taraj is fighting Lasker. Um, also, if you want to make a case for Chigorin, I mean, I mean, in any case, you could say that Taraj is living in the center of chess culture in the 1880s and 90s, and Chigorin, it's not as easy. So, like, you look at where Taraj got to play these great tournaments that he won Breslau, where he was born, now in Poland, Manchester, Dresden, Leipzig, all these places that would have been hard for Tagore and even to get to and to get uh, invitations to. Man, these um, pronunciations are insane, Jesse. You're crushing it. <laughs> the third of it. Uh, okay, next up, we got a long show. Um, <laughs> Schlechter. Schlechter, yeah. Nice, coast, yeah. Thank you, thank you. Did my best. <laughs> Who, now you who put Schlechter on the list, dude? That's who I want to know. Um, he's a fan fan pick, I think. Or is he one of David's? Was he on David's list? He might be one of mine. I mean, I put most of the people on the list because I started the list. Um, yeah, I put him on the list. Okay. Well, make your tell us why, dude. He drew a world championship match with the best player of his era, Lasker. I mean, it's because there was some culture that wanted to write a story about how great their culture was and they held him up and he became so popular and now everybody talks about him for no reason. Oh, my God. No, if anything, I think Schlechter gets uh, gets kind of a bad rap in history. For sure. He gets, he gets left out because he was probably the first player to draw a fairly high percentage of games. Ah. It seems like he would draw your ire for that, dude. It seems like, yeah, yeah, he. That. I mean, he he could. I'm not a fan of like lots and lots of draws, but I mean, uh, draws can also be a sign of being better at chess rather than like worse at chess. Like if you take a thousand games between two thousand level players and a thousand games between twenty five hundred rated players, the main reason you get more draws at the twenty five hundred level is greater skill and less mistakes. So. I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing to have some draws. And in his case, I think it was a sign that he was stronger than players who came before him, maybe a little less ambitious. Uh, apparently he was pretty, he was less uh, maybe egotistical and result driven than some chess players can be. Uh, so, because I, I read a couple little tidbits about good sportsmanship from him, uh, which could be a sign that, you know, he's just a little bit less dead set on winning a little bit more of a, of a chess artist. Um, anyway, he, he drew a world championship match. So to me, and you guys may have different rubrics, but to me, if somebody draws a world championship match, they have to be either S or A, basically. They're either world championship level or they're a contender. Um, I put him as a contender. I put him in the A tier. Yeah, according to Wikipedia, he would offer um, draws to opponents that were sick. And if his opponent arrived late for a game, Schlechter would inconspicuously use up time from his own clock to match them. Something that now like a lot of the top guys do. So that's true on the sportsmanship. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, you know what I say? I say nice guys finish last. That this guy's a pretender. I don't know. I have no business. This is a big list. It's a you, you can't just be some chump and make the list, dude. Okay. So this guy he drew with Lasker. True. Let's let's talk about who he also drew. You ever heard of a dude named George Marco? Kind of. I've heard of that. Yes, of course. You ever I heard have. of Adolf Zinkel? Not really. No. You know, I haven't <laughs> heard of that dude. Alipin, just because you know about the opening, that's the only reason you've heard of Simon Alipin. No, no, no. Semyon was like a. Uh, a fully decent player for the era. I mean, he was probably. I'm just top trying 10. to say, boss, you want to make this list. You don't just like draw these chumps. You got to show some some cojones, my friend. You he, know, he and he if gave you extra draw draws here and there. Away, 
You want to draw your life away? That's cool, boss. That's, That's fascinating. You ain't making my list. His You're match against Marco list. was 10 draws. Zero decisive games, 10 <laughs> draws <laughs> against Marco. I saw that, and I was like the first real grandmaster. Oh, my God. Let me just say, if you haven't been listening to this podcast forever, David Proust is one of the first people. Uh, that, let me just say, in my lifetime, the whole feeling towards draws and GM draws has shifted. And Bruce was one of the first to come out as a warrior, a warrior against the draw culture that Carl Schlechter in helped invent. <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe it Marco showed invent. up for the match and was just like, I'm sick this whole week, dude. <laughs> Let's share the purse. <laughs> uh, no, no, dude, no. That guy's a pretender. Mm-mm. He drew a match with Lasker, who you think is very good. Why couldn't Lasker beat him? I mean, that's 1910. Lasker's an old dude by then, man. You know? Not, um, not too old. Yeah. So not David's too saying, old to finish ahead of Capablanca in tournaments. Um, you're, David, you're saying contender. Jesse, you're saying pretender. Pretender, yeah. Um, Where are you going to go, boss? I, I would honestly put him in the... Uh, elite category all right there it is We're so, agreed. but um bit harsh but yeah you know honestly i do feel like he gets a bad rap in history because if you just asked me like before anything i would have been like eh, pretender you know screw him what <laughs> really <laughs> just based wow. on no my limited knowledge right just what you hear right. about these players you know so not really knowing to even make your tier list of non-world champions, he would have had to like beat Lasker and be the world champion to make it onto the tier list of non-world champions. Like, what's somebody supposed to do? Well, we'll get to question. those people. We'll get to those people, my friend. We will. Right. Interesting question. I guess, we'll, yeah, Jesse will explain us the criteria when we get to Ulf Anderson. We'll find out what makes somebody a real contender. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, boss. We moving on to old Nimzo. Um, yeah, next we have we have Nimzo. Nimzovich. Yeah. Aaron, the author. Um, he also did well. I mean, he was um he was a top player. For me, I would put him uh in the elite elite section. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh you know where I'm going. Agreed. I love this guy. Wrote a great book. Pretender, dog. <laughs> Pretender. I don't know. I saw this also. I was listening to some other podcast since they were talking about best. 60 best 64 players of all time they put him 64 i was like bows no i love the guy i love the writing probably mm-hmm. the greatest well i don't know it's not probably the greatest chess author of all time <laughs> in terms of how to write a sentence how to describe chess in terms of metaphor fantastic but when you look period briefly a period where he was in the top 10 in the world that does this is a big list my friend it's a big list you did not you gotta say that. one of the best chess writers of all time, Jesse. You 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 can't like clearly say that he's better than Tal or Kasparov or Alyekin. I mean, there's mm-hmm. there's like a couple people in that top tier. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna stick with it. Best chess writer of all time. Okay. You no, know, I gave him a, a uh an elite status, Kostya, a B. So you're going B. Jesse, you're yeah. also going B. No, I'm going pretender. Oh, sorry, you're going pretender. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I was thinking B, but let me let me think about it. I mean, let let me put it this way: it's clear that he wasn't a contender, right? Like yeah. he was not in the top two or three players. He's not somebody who you think like, oh, if Dog had just had a match against Lasker, like who knows what could have happened? No, you know what would have happened. <laughs> he would have lost. So. He's not, right. he's definitely not a contender, but I think, you know, he's probably like the number four or five player in the world at some point, which is so according to early. chess metrics, they place him as third behind Alakine and Capablanca for a couple of years, but, but like clearly, because he had a really bad score against Kappa and Alakine. Um, so he was kind of a clear, clear underdog to them. He did win a couple of, of events in the 1920s. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, I would give him, I would give him elite status as well. So I guess we're going elite. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And honestly, like he, he has this reputation as kind of like scholarly or whatever, cause he wrote great books, 
but he was also legitimately a good player. And even if you look at like the games in his book, sometimes, you know, his, his famous strategy that he's talking about doesn't even work out, but he swindles somebody by, by playing well, you know? So, I mean, I think he, he was definitely a strong player. Oh yeah. No, no, he was, uh, he was a fantastic player. Um, he's had some, some great games. Okay. Um, next is big Akiba Rubenstein. Yeah. yeah, I think Rubenstein's clearly stronger than uh, Nimzovich, for example. Um, so um, I put him as a contender. You know, he was able to win games against players, uh, against the, you know, the world champions of his day. He was able to win individual games against them. Uh, never played a world championship match against them so we don't know what like a long match would look like but i think that if you imagine in your head rubenstein playing a world championship match um of you know 10 to 16 games against uh against lasker or maybe even against capablanca you wouldn't be you wouldn't be sure of the result in advance yeah, I feel like he um, definitely could have been world champion um, if if he got the right match at the the right time. Um, he won five straight tournaments in 1912, which I didn't know. San Sebastian, Breslau, Warsaw, um, all these Sebastian. strong events. Um, and uh, Chess Metrics has him as the number one player between 1912 and 1914, so a couple of years. Which is interesting. Um, yeah, so for me, I definitely feel like he's somewhere between. I would probably put him at contender. I feel like mm -hmm. you would have to show a little bit more to be just, oh, clear he could have been world champion. Yeah. Uh, let me say this. Okay, so one of the things that's interesting about this one's hard in judging this is like when we think about world champions or i think uh there's generally something some kind of skill that they have that their peers don't have right so obviously we can talk about uh records you know how did they do at various times and that's important um and then Rubenstein's the first one on this list where I'm like, wait a second, this dude had a specific kind of skill set that he brought to the chess world, developed it, and then other people started emulating, right? So um, that's something I feel like, then you look at, you go down the list of world champions. For the most part, I feel like I can name some quality that each of the world champions had that then everybody else copied that's there's exceptions to that but for the most part and so anyways i'm trying to say akiba is the first dude who has that in this list but the problem is this dude had some terrible results oh buddy we're talking about basement of the tournament results you know and he also has the problem that his best years really are probably the World War I years, right? Big problem for a, a, several people going to be, we're going to be talking about wars and, and you know, how they got excluded. So that makes it very complicated for me to judge dude as well. I think he was like maybe, maybe a couple other people on this list, maybe a little mentally unstable, and that led to the vast swings in performance. Could he have beaten, uh, you know, Lasker and, and yada, yada, Maybe, you know, maybe. So I'm going to be either contender or elite on this one, but I'm going to go for a contender for Akiba. Okay. Well, it's hard. Yeah. It's hard for me. Sounds like we're all kind of, yeah, contender status. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. I would say, Jesse, you introduced this interesting criterion about bringing some new skill, some new quality mm -hmm. to chess play. And the previous person we just talked about was Nimzovich, who I would say also did that. Right. You could say Schleichter did it with the uh with the with the drawing technique. <laughs> the drawing technique. He introduced the most popular innovation <laughs> in all of chess history, Jesse. 
<laughs> oh, man. Uh, okay. Who put fine on the list? I did. Oh my god. All right, explain yourself, boss. Um, well, you know, I I don't necessarily know all of chess history that well, so I was like working through the years in my head trying to think of like uh mm-hmm. you know, who were top players and basically my mind alighted on the AVRO tournament of 1938. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um and that's where i came up with uh two of the lists two two of the uh two of the names on this list right um because we have uh the two co-winners of that tournament i put on this list and that's uh caris and fine and um i think that was a really really serious tournament and in that tournament they finished ahead of uh, four world champions, Botvinnik, Ilva, Aliakin, and Capablanca. Um, and I didn't go through Fine's whole like tournament history to ask myself if, you know, that was like a really ludicrous outlier and in all his other events, he sucked or something like that. But I thought, um, but I thought that, uh, that that was a pretty, pretty strong sign that he was uh, an elite player. Mm-hmm. Okay. Say U.S. propaganda, you know. <laughs> I think that the the U.S. story is almost always that there was nobody until Fisher, which is not quite true. You know, I think the U.S. had a decent Olympiad team in the '30s with uh, Fine and Rashevsky and and Kashdan. So, uh, um. You know, a lot of times people are like, Fisher came out of nowhere. There was nothing in the whole country, you know, nobody to play with, nobody to practice with, nobody playing games worth looking at. I think that's probably an exaggeration. I think, uh, I think Ruben Fine was a pretty good player, but I mean, maybe you guys know more and, and Jesse's going to uh, explain why I shouldn't have put him on the list. Uh, right. I don't know. Where do you have them, Jesse? So first of all, I really want to say that the Avro tournament of 1938 is a great, I, there's a little tournament booklet that had a great time studying that thing. It's really interesting. And that tournament is just so weird because you know all the other names and you don't really know fine. Most people don't know fine. And you're, you're like, oh, my God, this dude won the tournament. And he shared it first place still. But, you know, it's still like the, the fact that he won that tournament was is just astonishing. Because he really did come out of nowhere. And um, the reason this dude is a pretender for me is he didn't take chess as seriously as someone would need to take it in order to actually go for it. Right. Mm-hmm. It's youth. Uh, and then later even, okay, so let, let's just be clear, 1938, that was really going to be a qualification tournament, then World War II happens, both Karish, and I don't know how to pronounce Karish's name correctly, and this dude, fine, get hosed. Then later, though, this guy declines to enter the 1948 World Championship cycle, and I'm like, boss, you know, so if you're going to draw your life away like Schlechter or you're not going to go for it, I'm sorry, dude, you're not on the level. You're not on the level. However, let's just say the thing, the reason he got on the list is he had a brief run of tournaments in the 1930s. And what about what is it about American players that Fisher had the problem too? They were just playing other American players. And so he went, he got to go to Europe for a little bit, had some great tournaments in the middle of the 30s maybe something magical could have happened if he had a, got a shot at the title. I kind of doubt it, but it was, he did have a magical couple of years. Um, yeah. So, so there it is. Yeah. I'm, I think I'm closer to Jesse on this one. I'm going to put fine respectfully in the pretender category, mainly because um, he didn't win this tournament, but yeah, he just didn't play for very long. And what Jesse said, he didn't enter the 1948 cycle. Um, apparently he was only 30 years old at that point so he clearly left a lot of years on the table that he could have been um playing chess so yeah i feel like he definitely could have done done a lot more 
than he ended up doing. Though his results, I mean, were were quite good for for a couple of years against um, the world's. Wasn't the world's he best. like a like a psychologist or something in mm -hmm. his um in his career? Well, and you guys should know is that he published yeah. a book about chess psychology, and then the famous thing that is kind of stuck with chess. I think a lot of people don't know it was really an originated with fine, but was the idea that all chess players are trying to kill their father. That this right, is what the it's king about. is your father. King is the father, and you're trying to crush the father. And so that dude is responsible for that thesis, which yeah, I don't have a lot of sympathy for. But those were the years, no. the 30s and 40s, where you know uh, <laughs> Freudianism, especially in the United States, not so much in Europe, but especially in the United States and Japan of all places, really got a hold of the public imagination. Fascinating. Okay. Yeah. So with respect, we are putting him in the pretender category. Yeah. But let me just say, like, up to this point, there's a fairly low number of people who are professional chess players. And that's really about the time and the status of chess in society and economics and so forth, right? Like, you see, like, a lot of these players are actually doctors, right? I mean, Emmanuel Lasker was world champion. He had another career, right? And um, uh, who else? Schleichter was, uh, sorry, um, Tarash was a doctor, you know, so I think, you know, saying that somebody didn't choose to go for it is partly a thing of the time versus versus them, because there were probably only a handful of players who were really professional chess players at that point. Oh, yeah. Well, that's how it goes. You got to you, you know, got to suffer for your if, craft. My friend. If you wanted you to make it to this list, chess dojo's <laughs> tier list. Yeah, you got to <laughs> play some tournaments. <laughs> You, you should have thought of that. List, buddy. <laughs> you better get ready to suffer. <laughs> okay, yeah, we got to keep moving. Um, I think we're quickly um, going to be burning up time. So yeah, next, yeah, yeah. I think, is Bronstein in terms of no, the chronology. Karis. Oh, Karis. Karis. Sorry, I'm just going off the, the pictures. Um, okay, Karis, I think, is uh, incredible. I feel like he's often... He's often one of the first few names that come up when this list is mentioned. Yeah. Um, so for me, he's definitely at least a contender, um, but I could see an argument for him being world champion level. I feel like he was as good as some world champions um, that won't be named right now. Okay. All right. So you put him where are you put him, boss? I I'll put him in. I'll, I'd put him in a contender. I'm going to put this dude world champion level. Oh, yeah, same. Oh, yeah. okay. And, and I'll Good say I want to say a couple couple quick things about this. So <clears throat> his history really is important here and it's actually modern history is really reflecting something that's going on in, in Karis's life. So let's be let's, let's just dial this back a little bit. Estonia, dude. Estonia. It's got a similar problem in the 30s that it has right now. Russia wants to eat it. So <laughs> what happens is that um, Estonia allies itself with Germany, as do the Finns, as do a, does a section of Ukraine, as does Alekine, because Alekine's like, well, my family got host. So <laughs> there's a lot of people who ally themselves with the, the Nazis. And for most of my life, I didn't really get it. I was like, Oh, he had the, the the thing you would just read in the books would be like, well, he had some Nazi stuff going on. So, uh, yeah, forget about this, dude. And then now with world historical events, you're like, oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I understand being a friend of the Nazis in the 1930s. If you're in Estonia or Finland, give me a break. Anyways, so that's this dude has this problem. And then it's really hard for him to get a fair shot at the title. Plus he has the World War II problem as does fine, as we were just talking about. Further, I wanna add about Karis is that you talk about somebody who's gonna be world champion, you have to bring something interesting to the table that your compatriots, your peers do not have. And Karis brought the next level of attacking chess after Alekhine. So like Alekhine comes, brings science to attacking chess and Karis is like, okay, let's roll with that baby. And he brings it to the next level. So that's why for me, this guy is world championship level. 
I think the record is supports me largely as well too. Yeah. No, no, I think you guys are definitely right on 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 this one. I mean, I was like, okay, I was taking off some points cuz he never actually played a world championship match. Um, but you know, honestly, that might not have even been his fault. So yeah, he has this nickname like Paul the Second cuz he finished second in a bunch of uh, candidates tournaments and but okay, there's also apparently suspicions that he was literally under orders not to win these events, which seems totally uh, plausible. Um. Right. And, and, and also, where 1953 in Zurich, uh, it's well known now, most of my life this was not known, but it's well known now that the Soviets were cheating for Smyslov. Smyslov is my main man, but they were definitely cheating for him in that tournament. And that would have been one of the most likely chances for him. Yeah, and um, I think he was already, you know, I mentioned the AVR tournament, and uh, you guys didn't give much credit to to Ruben for it, but um, <laughs> but but I think that's like a moment in history where you're like, who's the best player in the world in 1938? Like, let me ask you that: who's the best player in the world in 1938, 1939, 1940? Right? Because you definitely passed Cop. Kappa's peak, right? He's having like blood pressure problems, maybe a small stroke during the tournament. Some some people have said, you know, and Botvinnik is probably not yet the best player in the world, right? I mean, Aljechen, 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 Aljechen maybe, but he's starting to come down a little bit. And you've got uh-huh. Kareez finishing ahead of him. And you yeah. know, there's a there's a period between, well, basically World War II, right? There's a period in World War II where it's not really clear who's the best player because people have other things on their mind than figuring out who's the best chess player in the world. But you could conceivably argue that that Kariz was already the best player in the world during those those war years. Um, yeah, yeah. you know, and if there had been a Kariz versus Aljechin match sometime during World War II, who knows who would have won, right? Um he won a close match against Max Elva during during the war, um, who had you know previously contended to some degree with with Eliechen. Um, so you you could argue like you're saying 1953, but you could argue that Kareez could have been the best player in the world anywhere from from 1938 until 1950 something. Yeah, I mean, I would like a pretty long period where he's taught. I would definitely take Karis over Oive, right, in terms of their career and kind of the games I've seen. So, yeah. I mean, it's just such a wild history for the Estonians in World War II. I mean, first, you know, Hitler and Stalin make a pact. Estonia becomes under Soviet influence. Then the Germans invade. And then he starts playing in German. So first in that first period, he's playing in Soviet tournaments. Then he starts playing for a couple of years in German tournaments. And then that's how he gets like the mark of shame on himself. And then after 44, he starts playing again with the Soviets, dude. Oh, man. The guy just wanted to play chess. Leave him alone, man. Oh, yeah. Dude. I put him at S tier and uh, I wait to see, you know, who on this list you guys think is better than Kareez. But uh, yeah, I think. I think it's a very fair pick. Um, Jesse, you got to do more like chess culture history videos because I think there's some fascinating okay. stories. Yeah, that yeah. Would, be, would be, especially the German pronunciations, dude. I think you could crush it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Vaz, let's keep going. Let's keep going. Uh, Bronstein? Bronstein. Okay. So uh, I'll put this to world championship level. I have some issues with it, but I'm going to put him up there. Uh, I think there's a, let's just say it all comes down to if you, to what extent do you believe he was pressured in his b- match with Botvinnik to throw it? He says he was, he's also the one, by the way, who lifted after the, after 1991 Soviet regime falls down. He's the one that lifted the, the whole thing about Zurich 1953. As an older man, clearly, mm, full of reprochement against all of the people who stopped him from becoming world champion. But in any case, I'm going to put him up there, man. Me too. Me too as well. All right, cool. I had him somewhere between world champion and contender as well, but he's certainly one of my, one of my top players on this list. So I think we're all kind of in agreement. Um, yeah. Super incredible player. 
uh, many fantastic games too. And yeah, it felt very close to just being world champion outright. Um, yeah. Okay, cool. Let's uh, let's keep it moving. Um, next we have Larson. Bent the Dent. Mm -hmm. I don't know his nickname. I didn't put him on this list. <laughs> I'll oh, put him I at think Elite, he... boss. All right, well, he's doing that. I'll put him at Elite. Let's just say the top Western player with Fisher for a long time. This was in a period of Fisher's... Uh, at one point, you could even say he was better than Fisher. It's important to remember about Fisher that in the early 1960s, he had not lifted his game yet. It's really in the late 60s where Fisher goes nuts. <laughs> might help to go nuts, my friend, that uh, he lifts his game and then he's clearly better than Larson. But there's a period where he is uh, as, you know, can, can lay the claim of the other best player in the West. Fair enough. He, I would put he him gets at a, elite. a B from me. Elite. He's definitely in the top six to eight players in the world, but you would never think of him as being a potential world champion. And after that game you covered, David, where he lost to Spassky, oh, buddy, I don't, can't look at the guy in the same light after that. <laughs> it's true. You never recover from that. Never and the other game of his, dude. the other game of his that made our list of, of best games of all time was Tall versus Larson. Remember? You, oh, that's a great it was, game, dude. That one, Jesse, that was brutal as well. And yeah, honestly, when I think of Larson, and then, you know, there's some Fisher games that I think of as well. So when I think of Larson, Actually, like all the games that came to my mind were games of him spectacularly losing to the people uh -huh. who were actually, you know, world champions. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I have to look up some of his best games and, and try and recolor my perception because it's not fair to, you know, to think of somebody who's maybe number four or five in the world at some point and all you know is like the games they lost to numbers one, two, and three. But But there it is, I mean... I think our ranking for him is is fair in tier B. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but he, he certainly deserves a lot of credit. He was an uh, incredibly interesting player. Um, okay. Next up, who we got? Korchnoi. Korchnoi. Okay. Um, I think he was a pretty clear S tier pick for me. I don't know about you guys. Yeah. Okay, him... quick. Is this a millennial thing with the S tier? Why don't? <laughs> what does that mean, S tier? You know, I think I think uh, chat's gonna kill me. I think it stands for supreme. It's like above A tier. You have like A tier, B tier, C tier, and then S is just above everyone else. Okay. It's like it, it's the same origin as people thinking like you should give a hundred ten percent effort or something like that, right? Like A, B, C were grades, right? Where like an A is a good grade. Uh -huh. Or is like the best grade and a B is a good grade and a C is a me mediocre grade. And then they're like, no, there has to be something better than like a good grade. So superb. Yeah, superb tier. Yeah, it's just a fun way of saying um, star tier, you know, head of the rest. Superb, superb. People are confirming. Um, mm -hmm. But OK, yeah, in our in our list, it means world champion um, level. Okay, boss, I'm going to put him as contender and um, definitely a person I've spent a lot of time studying their games. I think also you can argue that he brought a new kind of chess to the world with a materialistic calculating style that was very hard for his opponents to deal with, especially tall, could not deal with him. Um, and the reason I wouldn't put him world champion level is he – that's a really interesting story. I mean, he does have to really fight the authorities that be, you know? Um, and he's like playing these matches with Karpov as an old dude. And he still almost brings it. So if you want, if you guys wanted to put him at world champion level, I would understand. But I'm going to go with contender. And it's rough for him too, because Karpov was so strong in the 1970s. Yeah. yeah, contender tier A is where I put him as well. I mean, 
he definitely lost the matches to Karpov. If Fisher had kept playing, he would have also lost to Fisher. Uh, you know, he was a good fighter and, and you could put something in his favor of being like the longevity of the career and how strong he was over time versus, you know, somebody who for one year was really good and just had like a great result. Like, you know, Schlechter drawing some games with Lasker one year, but you could say that, you know, he didn't have as long a career because he didn't live as long. (laughs) (laughs) Um, he's uh, definitely got a world champion personality and world champion level trash talk yeah so if we're talking greatest players i mean Korshman was a great player you know he was a, a fixture of 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 the chess firmament for a long time great great games and, great longevity but yeah. but never quite ne- never did anything that would make you think like oh he should have been world champion i mean he was beaten up on top players in his 80s <laughs> his 80s boss oh damn <laughs> Also kind of a really interesting character, too, in that probably one of the nastiest people you'll ever meet, but like kind of nasty in a way that was fun for the fans to engage with, you know? Google the cow commercial. Oh, dude, Google the cow commercial. Of course. Yeah, that, was, that was wild. Who did yeah, he say great, um, Who did he say plays really well when the opponent is in time trouble? <laughs> he said someone like, this dude plays really well. When the opponent's under time pressure. <laughs> yeah, he had that pause. Ball. Yeah. <laughs> yeah he okay. said some nasty stuff, dude. That's that just dude. amazingly funny. Probably wasn't funny. It was the people he was saying it to. And, you know, I think a lot of times you think about the Soviets. I think they just, I, I think he was having a problem because he was such a jerk, dude. That's probably why he had to leave, dude. He was like, they're not giving me any chances because you were a jerk, boss. All right. <laughs> okay, next I think is gonna be either Timon or Ulf. Uh, Maybe either one. We have Anderson up next. Yeah, right. I, that was that was me. I felt Anderson. I don't know. Felt dude should be on the list primarily because I feel like he invented, uh, he gave a, a contribution to the chess world uh, in terms of how he played, and people in a lot of ways, couldn't match his playing style. So there was something about him where, uh, at least in certain kinds of positions, he couldn't be touched. And then in that period in the 70s, I feel like he's right up there. So I I put him in there. I'm going to put him as an elite player. Um, But he belonged, in my mind, on this list. Well, I would put him at elite as well. Uh, he's great okay but i don't remember him exactly being like yeah candidate well i mean anderson is jesse's is jesse's only selection for our list and the only person who should be labeled as a pretender and should not be on our list (laughs) so good work jesse um (laughs) the guy's like peak was like he was number six in the world for one month or number five in the world for one month no that's not not, he was not a top player nowhere near the level of any of the other players we're talking about today like there's a there's just a gap like why is he on the list i've got nothing more to say like he drew some games he never threatened to beat anybody Uh uh-huh he never threatened to beat anybody no Poor guy. Nobody that we're talking about today. I mean, he could have beaten me, but <laughs> oh, yeah. we don't even have the right photo for him. Poor guy. <laughs> <laughs> we don't even have the right photo for Just him. Just take him back <laughs> off the list since we don't have his picture, Ghost. Just <laughs> let it go. Change, change your vote to pretender. Come on. Let Jesse know how egregious this selection was. <laughs> No, no, I, I thought about Ulf. I thought about including Ulf. It's just uh, it was a long Are list. Are you kidding me? You thought of Ulf? Yeah. But you let us forget Leko. I think it's so funny that we have the wrong picture for him, man. It's just like the total insult. <laughs> it's because we couldn't even, no one could guess who you were talking. Nobody would know. Like, why would we be talking about him today? It's like oh when God. it's like when millennials merge the Gen X generation with the boomers and just call us all boomers. So it's that kind of insult. It's like forgotten about. Yeah, it's like if I if it's like if I put on the list Rosenberg and you guys were like, huh, which Rosenberg is he thinking of? Well, I don't know. 
<laughs> let me go right, Google search for Rosenberg and Chess and find a picture of somebody and put it on the list. All right, who put Tim on on the list, dude? Who did that? That was me. Post, yeah. All right, well, but that was along the same reasoning of thinking about putting Ulf. Like, I thought of Ulf and Jan Timmen, and I was like, eh, let's give it to Timmen. Um, I, I mean, Timmen, Timmen was good. You know, he was, like, number three in the world at some point. I mean, he was uh, battling with Kasparov, and... You don't you don't need to feel bad about this, Kostya. This is a far less stupid inclusion on the list than <laughs> Ulf. <laughs> Brutal, David. I mean, He's dude's still brutal. around, you know? He could be watching this. <laughs> Um, if, if if Ulf Anderson is watching, he'll be the first person to be like, "Dogs, I don't belong on a list with Bronstein <laughs> and Korchnoi and and Rubenstein." Oh man! One actually, one thing I want to say about Tim and that when we talked best books of all time, we didn't. We this is book he wrote is really great called The Art, and I think it doesn't get as much notoriety because. Uh, it's so difficult. And what is it? It's like a, a, a an attempt to really go deep uh, into analyzing. And it's a great book. And especially these books of the pre-computer generation are really interesting to look at because they give us a sense of what a top player of that time, uh, how they thought, you know, what variations would they consider and beautiful books. So I just want to mention that in there. But yeah, I think we're going with elite. So... Say elite, yeah, yeah. Tim and stuff for me because I feel like, um, you know, he did have he did have quite a few like candidate um, candidate uh, cycles, like candidate matches where he did he did well. Um, I just feel like you know he had a very hard competition in Kasparov and Karpov, right? So you always I always try to judge these players like okay, if the world champion what like if Kasparov wasn't around, then how how good or high would have would they have gotten? Um, yeah, for me, I put them between contender and elite, honestly. Here's um, here's a useful statistic for Jan Timon. At every single point in the entire history of chess, he was higher rated than Ulf Anderson. We'll see. Yeah, maybe contender for really me. You're really on it, dude. You're really on it, man. Thanks. <laughs> where, where, are you put him, where do you put him, David? Elite. Elite. Okay, you guys are both saying elite, right? Yeah. I mean, okay. Timon. Well, that solves that. I, I, I did some research the other day, right? And um, Timon was briefly ranked number two in the world for one rating list mm -hmm. right before Kasparov passed him by 100 points. <laughs> there was <laughs> yeah. one moment where he was number two in the world behind Karpov. And I think it was 1981 July, maybe, maybe even 1982 July. Obviously, Kasparov was already better than him, but his rating hadn't caught up yet. Um, but then, you know, we have to say, go, go another 10 years into the future to 1993 and Taman was like runner up in the, uh, candidates to Nigel short. Right. So it's like 10 years later and the dude is still like doing pretty well. Cause like winning your way through those candidate ma matches. Now that's. That's showing something, you know. That's not just getting a sponsor to sign a match for you with with Lasker because you came up with five thousand dollars. That is that is some heavy work. So you know he was probably like a top five player for thirteen years. That's pretty good. Yeah. But I don't think you would say like, oh, he had a really good chance to win the world championship. There was always quite a gap between him and Karpov and Kasparov. Right. Okay. Um, Next let's up, see. we got a really interesting one. We got Chucky. Yeah, Chucky, Chucky's cool. I feel like a lot of people think of Chucky as being one of the most talented players of all time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I feel like a lot of people do consider him as having like the potential to become world champion. Um, I would... Yeah, for me, he's between contender and elite like i never saw him as like battling for the world championship title incredibly strong obviously and like could have gone in there but somehow i just yeah haven't really i mean he never played a match right like even like a fide match so yeah let's no. say uh, that i would say there's three players on this list who i would put if i wanted to talk about like the most talented of all time 
And I would say Akiba is up there. Akiba did not start chess early. That was his handicap. Chucky, people hate it when I talk about autism in chess, but clearly the dude has a touch. Okay. And then we got to talk. We'll talk with Naka later. Naka just didn't never took his chess seriously. And he's still up playing good chess. Right. So those are three players that for various reasons uh, were the most talented and then didn't fulfill. With people who have a touch of the autism, you know, uh, it's there's a lot of other kinds of problems that come in and despite whatever advantages they might have. And with Chucky, it was like deep time pressure nerves dude the dude would be just shaking be freaking out man He'd be freaking out and but you look at the quality of his play and then it's like whoa man like you look at like who could have who could have possibly challenged kasparov in the late 80s 90s that was the dude that was the guy but he couldn't pull it together uh so for me definitely a contender definitely somebody who brought something new to the game um but for non-chess reasons, but definitely had to do with com competition, wasn't ready to be at the world championship level. Um, great video to watch. There's a video, I don't know, you can probably find it by like, <laughs> just him talking about a chess game afterwards, dude. It's stunning, like the variations he's doing in his head. It's It shows you what autistic qualities can do for you <laughs> over the chessboard. It's really studied. Anyways, oh, contender. For me. Yeah, the, the blindfold analysis from, from yeah, Gibraltar. Yeah, amazing, yeah. amazing. Um, okay, quick correction. Chucky did, um, he did play in the finals in 2002, thanks to chat. He he was the one that lost to uh, Ponomariev when Pono became the, the FIDE world champion. So he, okay. That's yeah, not that's a real not... match. That was like a, that was like a Grand Prix. No, no, but I, but I asked like, yeah. If uh, if he was ever close to like the FIDE one of the because that was like the world the FIDE okay, World Cup. Okay, you're talking thing. about their knockout. I thought I thought yeah, you were yeah. asking about like real matches. Yeah. Um, Chess Dojo, by the way, does not recognize the FIDE championship. This is something we <laughs> we've been through. Well, we're gonna talk about it. Yeah, in a couple uh, <laughs> a couple of players <laughs> for sure. Um, so Jesse, you're saying contender. I feel like yeah. you've convinced me on that. Where where do you stand, David? I had already put him as contender myself um, when I right, went through this. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, I mean, I understand there was sort of like a maybe some kind of a psychological piece missing and compared to some other players, you know, he didn't get very far in any real world championship cycle. Um, so I could understand someone else putting him at at elite over that kind of thing, but but his play was was fantastic and when I imagine you know, when I imagine him playing, you know, hundreds of games against the top players, like I think he he can perform quite well. Yeah. Yeah. Who put Aronian yeah. on this list, boss? Amazing player. I did. <laughs> I did. I think. No, I did. I did. Oh, David did. All right. But I would have put him on. <laughs> but you would have agreed. I mean, you know. Yeah. What are, what are you saying, Jesse? What do you mean? <laughs> I mean, he's a great player, dude. But like. He was he number briefly, two for a while. Yeah. Briefly made number two. That you think you think you, you think know. Ulf could have drawn him to there's games a lot in of pro? people there's a lot of people that we didn't put on this list first of all let's just say there's loads of people that didn't make it on this list yeah loads sure, of yeah. people for example that played for world championship that or were denied we could talk about uh sheer off being denied there's all kinds of people you know there's mm -hmm. all kinds of people who played in a world championship match short we're not gonna you know in any case we did uh, we did Aronian, snub sheer off short and Laco on the yeah. on this list, I gotta say, <laughs> but okay, it's, ne it's a long next, list. Next episode, next episode, <laughs> greatest chess players of all time, not included in the greatest chess players who were not world champions <laughs> yeah. video list. by Chess Dojo. It and is, then I think so, you know, yeah, Leco. So clearly, <laughs> sorry, uh, sorry, Peter. <laughs> clearly, an elite player, dude. Clearly, um, uh, an elite player, and has been so for a long time. But you know, briefly clicking number two is not going to make it. You know. 32 months, according to chat. Aronian was number two for 32 months. Yeah. Um, so over two years. And I remember, I mean, there was definitely a time where he was just the, okay, we could say this for a couple of players, like Fabi as well, where he was just the clear, like, challenger to to Magnus. Obviously, Magnus yes. is what, yes. hella, had, for reference, ahead of everyone. that's almost three times as long as Ulf spent at number six. <laughs> Ah, damn. Oh this man. Is not gonna end. It's brutal. <laughs> <laughs> brutal. Uh, so yeah, for uh, me, I um I definitely see him as a as a contender. I think um 
One of the things about Levon is that he's kind of infamously not performed in the candidates tournaments. When he, going mm -hmm. in, he was just one of the absolute favorites. So maybe a little bit like Chucky, kind of like not performing his best at the at the top moment. Um, but yeah, I I gotta I gotta put him ahead of ahead of the elite crew for sure. I actually only put him at elite, but I I think anybody we put in tier S A or B belong to be in this episode in this conversation. Um, and so I, I docked him for the exact thing that you mentioned, right? Without docking him as hard for it, but but I docked him for not really performing in any like candidate cycles. Like, how can you be number two in the world for three years and like you're just not even in the conversation for who's going to win the world championship? Um. No, no, he was in the conversation, just he didn't yeah, he no, didn't score he's, well in those. He, he's he's not. He's not he, he's not like, you know, challenging Magnus. He's not like playing the last round against Caruana with a chance to win the candidates. Like he's mm -hmm. he's not quite there. He's he's in the conversation that people are like, dude, Aronian seems really good. Why isn't he there? But he's not he's not truly competing for the world championship. How can you be that good and not compete for it? Right? That's kind of and I could have Doc Chucky the same. I mean, it's, it's pretty, you know, it could be similar. So I don't know why I did it the way I did, but I put him at, at B. I, I feel like. Okay. Yeah. I mean, Jesse, where I do you have him? I'm really threatened. Do you, are you asking me or David? Oh yeah. Jesse, what about, what about you? Oh, I, I said elite dude. And I said, elite. Uh, gotcha. it's very similar to let's say Grishuk. I feel like Grishuk and Aronian are both elite players, mm -hmm. but they're not contenders to Okay. Running well, I mean that. Running out of yeah. That's fine. No, no, that's all good. Um, I, I honestly, for me, I have a hard time putting anyone in the first and fourth categories. <laughs> you know, yeah. Everyone for me is. Uh, so. yeah, by definition, I think most of the players we're looking at today are going to be either A or B, right? They're either going to be somebody who could seriously challenge the world champion in, in their era, or they're going to be somebody who, you know, was playing in some candidate cycles, but you don't really think that they were. A, a, a full threat to the world champion, but they were somebody who would be playing with in the world championship cycles or top matches and tournaments. That's fair. Okay, next up, this one is controversial just because he's even on our list. Uh, Topalov. Um, now, obviously, yeah. Topalov won uh, the world championship, the FIDE world championship, <laughs> um, which we do not recognize here at the dojo. No, no, no. I don't recognize the Grand Prix, the two game events the but after kasparov retired there was this uh topolov became the number one player in the world and then they had this tournament in san luis for the world championship and he won it um and that was a reasonable format for a world championship and all the best players in the world were you know invited to participate and he won it and he became more or less world champion at that point. But that's just one tournament, right? I mean, Kramnik was definitely the the classical successor to Kasparov, and then Topalov played Kramnik and lost. Lost the match, right? So I feel like how could you say he's... I mean, to me, that was the unification match. I understand Topalov had a claim to the title, and mm -hmm. he... Uh, I, I wouldn't argue that he wasn't the number one player for some time, <clears throat> um, but I feel like... You got to beat the previous guy. Kramnik beat Kasparov. Anand that's, that's beat Kramnik. That's the only way to do it. Ding didn't beat Carlson. Botvinnik didn't beat Alyekin. Botvinnik yeah, yeah, became champion through a tournament. No, no, no. But uh, there was like, there was still a story there. Like Fisher gave up his title. Carlson gave up his title. Kasparov gave up his title to Kramnik. <laughs> and Kramnik didn't give up the title, right? He played matches. He played Leiko. He played Anand. He played Topalov. So it's just... Uh, by the way, I would put Ding in the contender list here. That would be where I put <laughs> Ding. He's a contender, you know. He's a contender. He he that earns the he earns the right to play Magnus and match. There you go. That's, that's fair. That's funny. Yeah, I think I would too. Um, so okay, for me, Topalov is also a. Uh, I would say he's a contender. Um, okay. I though, how you guys though between, I would say he's between WC and contender. Actually, I wouldn't. It's really like very 50-50, Just if I had to pick one. He oh, wow. was world champion, and if you're going to say that he wasn't world champion, he was certainly at a world championship level since he was the number one player in the world. And, and again, just for chat, we're, 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 he's saying, when David says he's world champion, he means the, the weird FIDE world champion. 
It wasn't not that weird. about world champion. It was no, a real I... tournament with people like Anand in it. And he proved that he was better than those players at that with point. With people Anand, like Anand. etc. Mm -hmm. Real world champion. Uh, no, I would I, I put him at world world champion level. I think for this list, I would I would put him up there. I put him in the top category. Oh yeah, I'm I'm a little I'm I'm surprised. I would put I, I, I you could stretch me from elite to contender, but <clears throat> for so many years he was below Karpov and Kasparov. In I would say his best years were in the you know in the nineties, and then he he was too uh, young for them. No, but he, you know, he was on the edge of that, at, you know, like late nineties, early two thousands, his best years. And yeah, dude, I think, and let me just say also, I, I just have this ancient history. I did have a beef with the dude in the whole toilet gate thing. He pissed me off. All right. So as a fan, maybe I prejudiced against him. I thought that was, I was really upset about it at the time. In a case. Toilet gate, definitely not cool. I'm with you there. The toilet After gate Kasparov cool. retired, he was the best player in the world. He beat mm, Kasparov in his last about? game. There was a guy named Kremnik who was clearly better. No, no, no. Who was approximately co-equal, but lower rated. Yeah, I think um, definitely. Yeah, I definitely feel like Topala was not worse than Anand and Kramnik for a good period of years. So to me, it feels, and they're they're both world champions, right? So to me, it feels fair to put them at world champion level. I'm convinced. Yes, yeah, we have an I'm interesting convinced. period between Kasparov and Carlson where you have co-equals, right? Sometimes in chess, you have a player who's like clearly better than everybody else. And sometimes you have sort of relative parity among the top couple players. And um, I mean, I don't think that period would have existed if, if Kasparov hadn't retired, but, <laughs> but it did. And there's a period of a few years where I would say it's really hard. To, I mean, I said Topolov was number one. He was number one by rating, but I mean, it's very hard to say if a non- Kramnik or Topolov was the stronger player. And if they'd played repeated matches against each other, each of them could have, you know, won matches against the other two at some point and lost matches against the other two. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and put him in the elite category. I went to the chess metrics, dude, and I, I was like, David, what are you talking about? So I like reconfirmed what my historical sense of the scene was. And I mean, number one in the world, maybe for like a second, dude. Number two in the world for a second, for number five and number four and number... Well, number three for just a second dog. And then usually often for most of his career between six and 10. So, and then you look at oh. the charts for Kasparov and Nan and Kramnik and he's just below those dudes, man. He's just below those dudes. So no, they, I'm were, definitely... they were around longer than he was for sure. But he was one of the first 2800s. I mean, that's, that's no joke. You know, that's, that's pretty, it's pretty serious. Oof. 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 This is tough. All right, where are you putting him, boss? Um, yeah, I feel like, you know, I don't know. I, I think it's the world champion for me. A lot of people consider him world champion, you know? So I think I would go WC. So me um, putting him in elite puts him into contender? How does well, it I think work it's, with I think it's two and one, right? But I, I, I'm, down, I'm down in blue and you guys are up in green. Right, so but... But if Jesse's yeah. just like still salty over Toilet Gate, and he's just like, trying I think to like I think it averages through. out to one because look, how is if, he not even a contender? He was if I said World contender, it'd be like one, two, three, right? So if I said contender, then his average would be contender. So if I'm saying WC, that has to that has to bump his average up. Either that, or we kick Jesse out of Dodo Talk. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I would say, got, got three I would names say left. I'd say Topolov is about the same level as Aronian. Those guys are at the same level. Put them right. That's there. what makes it so hard for me. Yeah, that's why I feel like Aronian deserves to be higher because in terms of their chess level, I feel like very similar. You want to make a? How about we make a compromise? We put both Topolov and Aronian in the contender zone. I'll go with that. Can we make that compromise? Because you guys no. are messing with me, putting up Topolov no. up the world championship level. You guys are really pushing it. No, I, I, yeah, I mean to push it. No compromise. You're just trying to hmm. sh shovel dirt on this guy. I would, For I no would make that reason. trade. I would trade to Polov. If we can put to Polov and Aronian in contender, I would. There we go. There we I go. I would vote. Can, see, I would see, vote David, on that. We can compromise here at the dojo. <laughs> we can compromise here at the dojo. Come on now. No, actually, I don't know. Just, ah, it's tough. Because Levon, he never played world championship. You know, how could he? No. Uh, Topolov not only played it, he won it. Shirov never played it either, man, but he deserved it. He earned the right. Come on. Damn, chess is just a cruel, cruel game.
that's a cool uh, no i think i'm good with the list as is people can uh, let us know yeah. what they think in the comments <laughs> Just, just let us know who's correct on this, all right? <laughs> so we don't. Know. We already know. We already know. Oh, you think that was controversial? Wait till we start talking about Nakanoof. Oh, Naka's damn. next. Here we go. Naka's you know, this next. This was the most controversial thing today. Was Topolov? I don't think like <laughs> there's nothing equally ridiculous that you could say about Naka. <laughs> all right, I'm gonna go ahead. I'll start Naka, dude. I think, by the way, I put this. We have a list where we just write down uh, topics where we might talk about future dojo talks. I think we should do a full dojo talk on Naka. It would be really interesting. Uh, I have a lot of, yeah, It's let, let's just say something. Naka, I think, is probably the most talented American chess player of all time. Uh, maybe in the, but you, if you wanted to make something about most talented ever, maybe. The kid had incredible skills and never developed them. Uh, he had a great uh, father-in-law coach that definitely helped him get a little bit of chess culture. But then the dude just like fell into the pit of blitz. And now he's in the pit of streaming, never able to find a psychological place where he could, you know, do serious work. If dude had done it, it's just like, oh man, clearly, clearly he would have, I mean, challenging Magnus. You got to say he would be able to challenge Magnus if he had taken this chess seriously. So, but is he a contender? No, no, he's not a contender. He's not there. So I'm going to go for elite, dude. But I just want to say when we do our list of most talented players, oh, buddy, you got to put him there. I've seen him play some games, my friend. I've seen, you know, I've sat next to him. I played against him several times. And, um, you know, and he also just through sheer talent, like was able to, yeah, it's, it's very. We're gonna have to do our own talk on on Naka. Yeah, that'd be a cool episode. I I agree with you. Just insane talent. Um, I do think he worked on his chess a little bit more than than you give him credit for. Like to get to the elite level. Um, mm -hmm. but but I would I would put him in in elite as well. I mean, the closest he got to the world championship, I guess, was this last candidates, right? Where he could have, if he drew the last game against Ding or yeah against Ding, he'd be playing the world championship against Nepo. Uh, okay, whether we recognize that as a real world championship is um, a different story. But yeah, I feel like he hasn't quite done enough um, to be a contender for me. And let me just say, even after that, so leading up to that tournament, had barely played anything, wasn't taking his chess seriously. That it then happens, it's just like, what's going on, man? And then after that tournament, he had some good results too, not even trying. So it's like, oh man, this guy, One as a fan, chess? it's so disappointing. I mean, I feel like to be a contender, like the most obvious qualification would be that you play a world championship match and lose it. That would be like the most obvious reason you would be in our A tier. And if you didn't even make a world championship match, then you'd have to really explain why. Like for Rubenstein, we have to explain why he didn't get a chance to, to play. There was no cycle. You know, he was good enough that it would have been an interesting match, et cetera. You have to have... So like for Naka, when... You know, there have been regular world championships every two years for the, <laughs> for the last, you know, 14 years during his main chess career. Um, I mean, he obviously wasn't a contender. Mm -hmm. So elite. I mean, he's been as high as number two in the world and very frequently, you know, in the top eight for a, for a substantial period of time. So he's an elite player, but one who never came close to being world champion. Okay. Well, I think we're all in a, in agreement there. Um, okay. So we got two left, Fabi and Nepo. Um, <laughs> Fabi, Fabi first. I think he's a pretty clear uh, contender. I think he'd have excellent chances to be world champion if it wasn't for Magnus. I still think he has excellent chances to be world champion, actually, um, for the next cycle. Um, but yeah, I put him in uh, contender. Yeah, got to put him in contender. And Let's just say he drew the match with Carlson. Drew them, yeah. That's very tight match, dude. And also one of the let's I probably I guess the I don't know, I haven't done the math, but like let's say that one of the greatest tournament performances of all time, winning the St. Louis thing. I think he's what did he go seven and oh to start the tournament, something ridiculous like that. Um, so definitely contender. And let's just say something obvious. I think 
I think, you know, if we're going to say Fabi, you know, went toe to toe with Magnus, unfortunately, we would also have to put the evil Karyakin in here, too. But for political reasons, he just kind of escaped our mind. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't think it was political reasons. Like, you know, Karyakin was number 16 in the world. Caruana um, was number two. There's like a difference in their overall. Okay. I'm just saying careers. when you go toe to toe with Magnus in a match, it's kind of. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a big deal. It's yeah. a big deal. I mean, you, you could have put Karyakin on this list, but I think, you know, rightly, if you judge their full career, Caruana is a, a head above him. Okay. Yeah. Um. I, yeah, I actually, and maybe I was wrong, but I'd put uh, Caruana at S tier, actually. He was my third S, along with Bronstein and uh, and uh, Kariz. And Wait, what about you know, Topolov? Topolov, if you insist on putting him on the list, but I don't think he should be on our list today. I think. Oh, gotcha. I think he should. Yeah, just let me just say, champion. I'm putting Fabi as contender, and you're putting. There's no way that Topolov is above Fabi. It's just like, what are you doing to my list, boss? Why what are you doing? Above? I put them both as. No, asses, career but... career wise, I I kind of agree. I feel like. Just because Topolov is lucky, he did, he wasn't around during, or I mean, he's he's around, but Topolov was lucky. That Magnus wasn't dominating you know, <laughs> that, that 10 years, right? Like yeah. before Magnus showed up. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know if like S was slightly too generous on my part for Caruana, but if you look at his career trajectory, think about it like this. Imagine there hadn't been Carlson. Then you have to think that from, you know, 2010 to 2020, Caruana has the best chance of like anyone else of who would have been world champion during Carlson's era would probably have been Caruana. He had one of the highest ratings in all of history, right? When he got to 2850, um, yeah. which only three people have done Magnus, Gary, and Fabi. He drew a match with Carlson. So, I mean, he, he really did everything other than outright win the world championship. Um, so, so yeah, so I put him at world champion level. Um, yeah, so, I, I, yeah. yeah, I don't know. I feel like, um, I mean, Fabi, Kriakin, they, they drew the match. I kind of think it's also a, a, a bug of the format of the system, you know, 12 game matches, very short, can't take a lot of risk. Um, you know, to me, it's like Magnus is clearly a superior player to them. So the fact that they drew him in a world championship match, I mean, obviously they're very strong, but I feel like that's partly to do with the format itself. Like if you draw one game against Magnus, that doesn't mean you're equal to him, right? It means like you drew that one game. So the 12 games, I feel like is also not a super long sprint. I agree. It's not super long. Anyway, um, we're, I think he's going in contender. He's going to contender. Neil, Neil Bruce in chat is, is properly chastising David. And I like this phrase. We're going to stick chaos. That's what happens in these talks. He just sometimes goes chaos. Just goes chaos. Just like no, no, no. Spinning, Look, tops, it's spinning out of control. Not at all. I said it's between <laughs> S and A. And I said maybe I overestimated him. It's a close call. I mean, I think he's, if you put him in A and then you look at the records of the other players in A, mm. he's like better than the other people in the tier you've put him in now, right? Mm. Um, and Apparently I, Korchnoi has a winning record against Fabi, just for the... <laughs> and I don't stand aggressively on, uh, <laughs> on on my position, you know? I think he's like on the borderline between those two <laughs> areas and I'm fine with you guys putting him A. No all chaos right, here. Very I'm putting close. that you, you, Jesse, have been yeah. chaos today. You gave <laughs> us your crazy ranking on Topolov and including him on the list, then then throwing salt on his wounds. And the only player that you suggested should be on our list today was Ulf Anderson, who Kostya couldn't even guess which Anderson you were talking about. It was so ludicrous. So I think <laughs> as far as point, we owe all our thanks to Jesse today. I've done <laughs> I've done nothing. <laughs> All right, boss. I'm putting Nepo in the elite category, boss. He's not the contender. No. He's an elite player, though. He's an elite player. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Um, yeah, he I put him in contender. Um, I would say maybe closer to elite than world champion, if I had to pick. 
Um, but Nepo, I mean, you know, last two World Championship matches, very close to beating Ding. So he just would have been excluded from the list um, if he had finished basically like one game and, and towards the end of the match. He was super, super close. Um, so yeah, I know we're running out of time here. So yeah, I'll go contender. What do you think, David? No, but wait a second. Wait a second. To be a contender, you need to be in a position where maybe you could have fought for the world championship. Nepo got spanked, boss. Spanked. It's not, it's not it, it wasn't even a thing. He was like a gazillion rating points lower than Magnus. It, was, it wasn't even a thing, dude. It wasn't even a thing. It's spanked by Magnus, but but he was very close to to beating Ding. I mean, we gotta respect well, I would put Ding as maybe a contender. You know, Ding could go up there as a contender after winning this match because then maybe he's gonna have a shot at the title. I, I see you're, you're judging them against Magnus, which makes sense. I mean, that's yeah. uh, that's fair. Um, All right, Dave, where's where's Nepo going? Yes, yeah, I still pull him at contender, but I, I get what you're saying. I get where you're coming from. Uh, Nepo is elite tier B, but with the asterisk that his career isn't done yet, you know, um, he's somebody who's still kind of at the peak of his entire career right now. So he could move up in the next couple of years if he if he made it back to the world championship match. But um his defeat to Magnus was uh you know there was no contending involved. He was completely dismissed. Um you know his rating hasn't been over 2800 when other you know if you want to be world championship level after the year 2000 your rating needs to hit 2800 <laughs> yeah. if you want to be at a world championship level. So you know he's he's come close, and there's been rating deflation. I'm 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 open to to him moving up to A at some point, but for now I would put him at at B, high B. Okay, I okay. guess we got him at elite, folks. I wanted him up here, but uh, the guys they want him in elite. So don't don't come for me in the YouTube in the YouTube comments. Yeah, and um, the only one I'm really coming. upset about is the top of love thing. That's the only one I'm truly upset about. Okay, so I'll just leave it there. Yeah, it's a controversial pick. Um. For sure. I'm upset about Levon mostly. I feel like he, he deserves higher, but uh, maybe I'm just more upset about him, you know, not doing enough to convince you guys, right? I'm not upset about your yeah. ranking. I'm just yeah, upset, you upset about upset the situation. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, there you have it, folks. There is the objective list. Um, we'll put the tier list in the description of the show and in the comments. So if you want to make um, your own rankings and then post them somewhere, and tag us, uh, you are more than welcome and invited to do so. I'm always curious when people have differing opinions on this stuff because it's all very subjective and I'm just curious where um, people place their uh, their thoughts. Um, apologies to everyone involved, obviously. And uh, yeah, thanks for, <laughs> thanks for tuning in.